right. So I'm going to be I'm a scientific advisor for um, a variety of companies. Be talking about OCD as a circuit disorder, kind of um, riffing off some of the stuff that uh, Dr. Lee was saying a second ago and giving people some context. And then and that hopefully that builds to thinking about um, OCD um, TMS. So, you know, all of us can think about psychiatric conditions at various levels of organization, right? Uh, this is a figure out of a, a paper a number of years ago. So we, we typically tend to think about um, psychiatric conditions at these kind of first two levels, right? This kind of output or behavior level and this um, synapse level. So if you, people talk about, you know, the behaviors that make up OCD or the behaviors that one wants to do, or, um, kind of focus on or think about as it relates to therapy for OCD. Um, another way of thinking about OCD is a problem at the synapse level. And that's why uh, psychiatric drugs make sense, right? So if you're gonna give somebody a psychiatric drug like Dr. Rodriguez was speaking about earlier, right? You're gonna, you're gonna be interacting uh, conceptually, at least the old way of thinking about it at the, at the synapse level. Um, and these also kind of correspond to the way psychiatry has been thought about um, historically, right? So we, we've thought about uh, first, you know, uh, psychiatric conditions being content related, and, and, and that was kind of the area, era of Freud. And then psychopharmacology uh, came about in the you know, mid 50s, 60s for, for these sorts of problems. And then, um, and then now we're kind of entering into what I call psychiatry 3.0, you know, this third era of psychiatry where we think about these conditions as being conditions of um, aberrant connections within neural circuits, abnormal kind of electrical signaling within neural circuits, what, uh, what Dr. Lee and Dr. Rodriguez were calling loops in the brain, so abnormal signals within those loops. And uh, not only uh, brain stimulation, but also medication and psychotherapy are acting on those loops. Um, and so it's a useful model because it allows for us to think about all these therapies as they affect those loops. And, and it's also important to kind of understand, and, and uh, Dr. Lee kind of hit on this earlier, right, that um, the circuit model of thinking about uh, psychiatric conditions, and today we'll be talking about OCD, is a, a useful model because it also helps us to think about neurological conditions like dystonia, or some of you in the audience may also have Tourette syndrome, for instance, um, along with OCD, right? And so, um, you know, this kind of line in the sand that we, we call neurology and psychiatry kind of dissolves um, under the framework of thinking about these problems as circuit disorders. Uh, they all seem to be circuit disorders just affecting different brain circuits. But OCD is, is specifically, you know, um, a, a circuit disorder involving a lot of the emotional circuits. Um, and, and with that sort of a problem and with that way of thinking, you can think about um, circuit disorders as needing circuit therapeutics or circuit interventions. Um, Dr. Lee did a great job of talking about uh, deep brain stimulation. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez and I have, have worked together on using transcranial magnetic stimulation. Um, I've had a lot of interest in um, in cortical, implanted cortical stimulation. I think Dr. Lee is working on some of this too, right? But these ideas that we can we can utilize um, devices, um, you know, across kind of across the level of invasiveness from not non invasive to an invasive to modulate brain circuits. And there's a bunch of reasons to choose one or the other. And uh, some of that has to do with severity. Some of it has to do with the clinical picture. But nonetheless, we have this great emerging toolkit, right? And, and what's useful about that toolkit is it means that we can actually engage the brain circuits that are, um, that are giving folks um, a hard time, giving folks a lot of symptoms and we can move those brain circuits, we can modulate them, we can change them, we can seemingly normalize them. And so this is a, a video I always like to show when I give OCD talks. It's, um, I'll be talking about TMS later, but just conceptually, it's uh, an OCD patient that 
I was involved in the deep brain stimulation uh, surgery for, I'm the, the, on kind of the closest side to the screen, um, the surgeons are behind this plastic drape. And what's important to understand about this um, particular video is that um, this gentleman had a, bought 365 toothbrushes a year. He threw away one every single day of his life um, because he was concerned about contamination. He had a whole host of OCD symptoms, but that one was one of the, the ones that, that bothered him the worst, that con you know, contamination fear, uh, contamination obsession. And he, um, and it was the one that we really wanted to kind of expose him to in the operating room because we're looking for a signal, kind of a physiologic readout of OCD. And, and why is that important? Well, because as we understand from, from things like seizures and, and, and other problems in neurology, the shaking or, or whatever it is in the case of the seizure is a reflection of the abnormal brain activity. In the case of OCD, the, the thinking and the behaviors um, are a reflection, we think, of abnormal brain activity, right, in circuits. And so you, you'll see and hear um, this circuit firing off as we give this gentleman um, this contaminated toothbrush. Now, we, we did this with a non-contaminated toothbrush before and his brain was totally quiet, but you, you'll see as we give him the contaminated toothbrush, the little red line on the bottom, right under the, the video is the brain activity. And we're recording in an area that's uh, a deep brain stimulation target for obsessive compulsive disorder called the ventral striatum. People call it the nucleus accumbens. It's the reward center in the brain. It's the area that the FDA has approved for, um, for OCD, deep brain stimulation in the United States. And <clears throat> so now I'm giving him this contaminated toothbrush. This is totally safe because this is what we call the non-sterile side of the operating room. So it's not, the, it's not on the side where the brain surgery is happening. He's got a wire sitting in deep in his brain where that, where that uh, permanent wire is gonna go and we're recording inside of it. And you can see, this is the signal of OCD, right? This is the kind of physiology of OCD, at least as recorded in this gentleman in this one spot in his brain, right? And if you've got that signal and you kind of understand that underlying problem, you can start to um, disentangle um, the, uh, the reasons why this is happening at the brain level. And so that's important. And so now, we kind of listen to the brain, right? Uh, and I'll skip this one. Um, and so now we want to kind of send signals back into the brain. <clears throat> and so we've known for a long time that you can find a spot in the brain. And this is kind of the old way of doing brain surgery and do lesions in specific spots in the brain and produce improvements in OCD. We've known that for almost a hundred years. We've known more recently that those uh, improvements from a lesion are, um, are because the brain is organized in these loops. <clears throat> and um, if, if you use transcranial magnetic stimulation, what you're doing is you're simply stimulating an area called the cortex that's closest um, to allow for you to access one of those loops. And so I'll show you a brief part of this video just to give you a sense of what this Imagine looks like. a magnetic wand. So we'll skip to this to find spot. Out if such a thing could actually work, I offered my own brain for a test. It seemed like fun at the time. Hold it up, you can look at it. Psychiatrist and neurologist Mark George said he could make my thumb twitch. Jeez, it does. So if you can see that, what you're seeing is the magnet. This is a magnet sitting outside of the head. The magnet is pulsing a magnetic field, there's, there's a physics principle called Faraday's law. So when you pulse a magnetic field, you generate current transiently or temporarily in the substances underneath the, um, the area where the magnet is and you cause essentially a firing of those brain neurons, those, those kind of what we call cortical neurons. And that firing sends a signal through this entire loop. So in this case, he's got the coil sitting over the area that's involved with motor function or volitional control of movements. You can also put such a coil over 
emotional areas too, right? You can send signals over emotional areas too, and you can send information through the system to change the activity within that circuit. <clears throat> so one of the areas that's been, um, you know, a lot of folks have focused on over the years is what we call the orbital frontal cortex. And so early trials demonstrated that people with OCD had a lot of activity in this area and drugs when effective reduced activity in that orbital frontal cortex. And we'll, we'll kind of skip in the interest of time. And so that, that orbital frontal cortex is kind of here. Can everybody see my cursor? Another area that's been in, you know, of interest is this anterior cingulate area that's kind of medial, this kind of medial part of the brain. So we'll be focused on those, those two areas. Um, that's this kind of cortical, these cortical areas described in this loop right here. So this is where our TMS has mainly been explored over this kind of frontal pole over the frontal cortex, which is basically kind of in the center of your forehead and then the anterior cingulate area, which is kind of in the middle of your head. And that's where the FDA approval um, approved spot is. And so there've been a number of studies looking at at both of these spots, this first um, spot, which we call dorsomedial prefrontal or anterior cingulate. In this study, about 50% of folks receiving this once a day, five days a week for around six weeks, had a 50% or greater benefit, which is pretty, pretty striking given how hard it is for, for folks with kind of treatment resistant OCD um, to improve from meds at this point. So these are, these are folks who, um, you know, who are quite severe and yet about 50% of them were able to achieve benefit. There was another study that was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry um, a couple of years ago, leading to an FDA approval in 2018 for TMS for OCD. And that um, th these are the results of that study. So you can see that uh, folks getting the fake or sham um, TMS, we got about a three, four point um, improvement, uh, maybe, maybe more like five by the end of, uh, of the treatment course. And the people that got, um, got active, they, they doubled that, right? So they reduced their YBOC um, uh, about eight points, right? And, and that, that's very meaningful, especially to people that are quite severe, because that could mean going from eight or more hours a day of, of being, um, you know, doing behaviors and being distraught about behaviors related to OCD to more like three hours a day. And so that, that could mean for for folks that, uh, that this could get them back to, uh, to work, let's say, um, if they're, if they're out, out of work because of, of OCD. Um, so, you know, very striking, the active treatment, you know, had a whole lot more folks kind of in the range of, of you know, less disabled than the, than the sham by the end of the trial. Um, we'll skip this one and this one. The, uh, the next target that um, I described earlier is this orbital frontal, frontal polar cortex target. People have explored this um, as well. This is a, a positive trial uh, published a number of years ago where they, they stimulated this area again once a day, five days a week for around six weeks. They were able to separate from, uh, from sham and, you know, about a similar sort of thing, uh, about a, you know, seven, eight point spread between those two. Um, you know, so rather compelling as a, as a treatment location. So we're very interested in doing um, rapid acting treatments for a host of conditions for, um, for both depression and OCD. And we've gotten into a, a number of other um, psychiatric conditions of interest, borderline personality disorder on the inpatient unit, things of this nature. And, um, and so the, the main reason for this is because um, just like I'm sure Dr. Rodriguez uh, spoke about earlier and, and Dr. Lee, uh, you know, waiting around for, for a treatment to work over six or eight weeks and then seeing that it maybe it doesn't work and having to try another one, you know, people can lose their jobs during these times. People can become disabled during these times. People can go from a place of doing okay in life to losing everything, just waiting for these drugs and, and, and these things, you know, these kind of standard things to, to kick in. 
So we've been very interested in this idea of being able to do this in a very short period of time, right? And so um, where, you know, say the, the uh, FDA approved uh, stimulation dose, number of pulses for, for theta burst for depression um, over um, six weeks is 18,000 pulses. We can in depression and we do in, in both of these OCD approaches, deliver this amount of stimulation in a single day, right? So we can really drive people's um, brain circuitry quite quickly uh, so far. And we've treated, you know, more than hundred people. This appears to be um, safe um, to do. And it gets people out of these symptomatic uh, situations um, in, in a different sort of time scale. In the time scale of, I'm gonna take a week off of work get treated and I can still go back to work and nobody will know the wiser that I, that I was, uh, you know, I didn't just take a staycation, but I actually also um, was able to receive some treatment during that time, right? That's a time scale that actually is reasonable, we think, right? And so the, these are the sorts of things that, uh, that we've, we're interested in. Like I said earlier, uh, Dr. Rodriguez and I kind of partnered together for this early pilot, this early pilot, work where we were able to see that three out of seven people in this group experienced remission from OCD. So they went into the range that we don't normally think about with OCD, where they, they had normal levels of, of thinking and, you know, obsessing and, and any, any kind of compulsions. They kind of went into what, what's really a normal range of that people without OCD sort of range, right? Um, so this is the trajectories for those for those folks, um, two other folks had some some benefit, not quite as substantial as, as those three main um, folks. And we were stimulating this area where the dots are. Um, we've uh, been doing more of this. So this is um, more piloting that we've done more recently and similar sorts of reductions in people. Um, you know, so we've now, um, and, and Cornell's partnered um, with us on this. So now we've got um, you know, a fair amount of data uh, demonstrating some real promise with this. So exploring that further, and we'll talk about that in the in the breakout um, session about how to how to get folks uh, involved and interested um, in this in this research as we um, try to recruit quite a few uh, people over the next uh, several years to kind of go through this TMS approach and evaluate it in a lot of people and really see get a sense of this. This is my lab. Pre-COVID, um, you know, waiting on the the day when we we don't have masks on and we can, um, you know, we can take another picture again. Uh, this is our funding agencies. Um, we recently uh, found out that we we had we received some word that we're going to get some funding from uh, Welcome Leap as well, and I need to get their logo up here. So exciting stuff. Um, and this is the um, this is the way we can get you can get in touch with me and, and um, uh, we'll give you more information in the um, breakout uh, session as well. So.